Hi there. This is Brother Merrill's Inspirational Stories. I have really enjoyed the comments and the participation that people have had. I'm going to do a live broadcast on Wednesday the 27th on YouTube at 7.30. That'll be March 27th, 2024. I'd invite you to tune into that so that I can field your questions as we talk about what I'm going to discuss today. I'd like to tell the story about one of my heroes. This guy is amazing. Parley P. Pratt. He made the statement at one time that gross darkness covers the earth. And if that doesn't describe our day, I don't know what does. But we've been called to be witnesses of Jesus Christ. Of course, the greatest witness that stood against evil throughout time and eternity is our Savior and Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Before the meridian of time, there were some awesome examples. I love the story of Elijah, where he challenges the priests of Baal, and then to taunt them, he dumps barrels of water before he has the Lord consume his bullock. Nephi stood against his brothers. Who hasn't been thrilled to think of Abinadi in chains before the priests and the court of King Noah, standing and saying, touch me not. Those men have had courage. Since the Savior came, the Apostle Paul was another awesome example of someone that was just possessed with the Spirit of the Lord. The Savior had appeared to him and converted him from being an enemy to Christianity to being its champion. And who can forget the prophet Joseph Smith, standing in chains and majesty, in front of his jailers. Another example that many people, particularly young people, don't know much about is Parley P. Pratt. And if Brigham Young is called the Lion of the Lord, (laughs) Parley P. Pratt is surely the bull, the charging bull of the Lord. He was an amazing individual. He married Thankful Halsey, and they moved west to the Black River area and started what he called his wilderness home. And after several years of industry, working for others, working for himself, he had a beautiful little place. Had orchards, gardens, fields. He had cleared a lot of the land and had a beautiful place. And during that time, he was possessed with learning about the gospel of Jesus Christ from the Bible. He just studied constantly, had a thirst to understand. He knew there had to be apostles, there had to be prophets, there had to be baptism, there had to be revelation. God was unchangeable. Where were these things in a modern church? They weren't there. And a man, a Reformed Baptist preacher, and a companion came into his valley, and he listened to him, and they agreed with one another, and he became enthused with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The word enthused means God or fire in us. And that describes Parley P. Pratt. He and his wife talked and he said, if a man is converted to the gospel, he's got to be willing to leave everything, his father, his mother, his home, and go out and spread the word. And so he began to just tirelessly go out and teach the gospel of Jesus Christ as he understood it. He and his wife left their home with $10. They traveled to Cleveland, and Parley was able to wrangle his way into a a schooner. The captain didn't have enough people to sail the length of Lake Erie. But so Parley actually sailed this ship the full length of Lake Erie. When they landed in Buffalo, Parley booked a passage for he and his wife on a canal boat. But there weren't a lot of people on the boat. And before long, Parley had talked to everybody on board, I'm sure. He told his wife, I got to go preach. We're booked. You're paid up till Albany. Your families will meet you there. And then you go to your family's home and I'll be there eventually. I'll walk. And then he began to meet people walking along and talking to them. As he walked, he met a man named Mr. Wells. And Mr. Wells told him about a very strange book. He said, if you'll come to my house, I'll let you hold it. You can read a little of it. And Parley felt 
the spirit. And he walked to Mr. Wells' home. I should have done this at the beginning. Here's a picture of Parley P. Pratt. Who I choose to call the, the bull of the Lord. This is what Parley said when he read the Book of Mormon for the first time. As I read, the Spirit of the Lord was upon me, and I knew and comprehended that the book was true, as plainly and manifestly as a man comprehends and knows that he is. From the moment he read the Book of Mormon, he knew it was true, and he became possessed, enthused with the Spirit of the Lord. Mr. Wells told him that this Joseph Smith guy lived in Palmyra, which was some distance away, about 30 miles. And so he walked to Palmyra. When he got there, they said, well, uh, the Smith house is about three miles outside of town. As he was getting near the house, he met a man who was herding some cows up the road towards the same direction he was going. And so he talked with him. And, and as they visited, he introduced himself. And he had met Hiram Smith. Hiram and Parley just hit it off completely. They were up all night. Hiram gave him a Book of Mormon, but he had made two appointments to preach 30 miles the other direction. In the morning, he had to take leave and head back to where he had made these appointments to preach. And now he had all this information about the Bible that he'd been gleaning for several years, but he also had this new Book of Mormon. He had one with him, but he didn't know it'd be worth a million dollars nowadays. But anyway, <laughs> he, he uh, probably more than a million for his copy. So he went back and he preached two sermons, and then he left the town and all but ran to see Hiram. And when he got there, he said, you have the authority, you have to baptize me. I have to be baptized. And so they took him down to the water's edge and Hiram asked Oliver Cowdery to baptize him. And then they confirmed him a member of the church, gave him the gift of the Holy Ghost, and then they conferred the priesthood on him and made him an elder. That Sunday, imagine this, you got Hiram Smith and Oliver Cowdery probably sitting on the stand, and who do they ask to speak? Parley P. Pratt, this new convert. And after the sermon, Four families came up. The men were in tears and asked to be baptized. So Parley had a way with him, an enthusiasm that was contagious. And he had to take leave and he said, my wife is across the state. I've got to, I've got to go. He walked to Albany and then down to Canaan, which was the area that he was raised in, and there he reunited with his new bride. He began to preach the gospel to his family, and he made the first real significant convert of many, a future apostle and his brother, Orson Pratt. Parley could not be contained. Hiram had told him that Joseph would return soon from Pennsylvania, and so he said goodbye to his wife and his family, and he walked back halfway across the state of New York to meet Joseph Smith. And he has the most eloquent, beautiful, complete description of the prophet Joseph Smith that I have ever read. I'd like to share it with you. This is what Parley P. Pratt said of Joseph Smith after he met him. He possessed a noble boldness and independence of character. His manner was easy and familiar. His rebuke was terrible as a lion. His benevolence unbounded as the ocean. His intelligence universal. And his language abounding in original eloquence peculiar to himself. Not polished, not studied, not smooth and softened by education and refined by art, but flowing forth in its own native simplicity and profusely abounding in variety of subject and matter. He interested and edified, while at the same time he amused and entertained his audience, and none listened to him that were ever weary with his discourse. 
And I just love that description of the prophet Joseph Smith. Parley had a, a way with words that was beautiful. He's written some beautiful hymns and some other descriptive things that I just find poetic. Shortly after this meeting, Parley P. Pratt and Oliver Cowdery with two other men were called to the Western States Mission. Now, in today's world, we think of the Western States as Oregon or California or Washington. Well, they thought of it as Western New York and Ohio. And so they went on their way and they began to preach. Crowds were gathering around them and they were having no problem. And they got back to the area that Parley P. Pratt had lived in and he looked up this Baptist preacher. And before long, he converted the preacher and most of his congregation. The preacher was Sidney Rigdom, a member of the First Presidency, Isaac Morley, Edward Partridge, First Bishop of the Church, John Murdoch, and Lyman White, another apostle. He says that thousands of people flocked to them. Some were curious, some were truly interested, and some had come to mock. While they were in that area preaching, and thousands were coming to hear them, some of the people were quite disturbed about what they were doing. And he was in Simeon Carter's home one night, and he was explaining the prophet Joseph Smith's revelation in the Book of Mormon. A knock came at the door, and it was a constable that had come to arrest him on a frivolous charge. Parley left the Book of Mormon. Eventually, Simeon Carter read it, became converted, and became a solid member of the church. He went with this constable. And when he got to the supposed court, he found a judge who was swearing oaths against him and his companions, saying, I'm going to send you guys to prison. You're going to be fined. We're going to get you out of here. They had false witnesses. They swore out testimonies against them. And at the end of the court, Parley decided, he said, to treat the whole matter with contempt. And he didn't say a word. He just sat there and just let them spout off. And finally, the judge asked him if he didn't have anything to say. It's really quite hilarious. I'll have to read this to you. I was soon ordered to prison or to pay a sum of money which I had not in the world. It was now a late hour and I was still retained in court, tantalized, abused, and urged to settle the matter, to all of which I made no reply for some time. This greatly exhausted their patience. It was nearly midnight. I now called on Brother Peterson to sing a hymn in the court. We sang, Oh, happy are they. <laughs> This exasperated them still more, and they pressed us greatly to settle the matter by paying the money. I then observed as follows. May it please the court. I have one proposal to make for final settlement of the things that seem to trouble you. It is this. If the witnesses who have given testimony in this case will repent of their false swearing, and the magistrate of his unjust and wicked judgment and of his persecution, black guardianism, and abuse, and all kneel down together, we will pray for you that God might forgive you of these matters. <laughs> uh, well, obviously, that was not received well, so they were sent to prison. But there was no jail nearby, and since it was the middle of the night, they locked up Parley in a public house, and a sheriff was set to guard him. His friend, Brother Peterson, took off. So in the morning, the sheriff had to take him to a tavern to have breakfast. And while the sheriff and Parley sat in the tavern, Brother Peterson and Oliver Cowdery and the other companion, they <laughs> came by and saw him in there with the law. And Parley said, hey, go ahead, I'll catch you later. He sent them on their way. I've got to read this story because I love this. Part of this story is about a bulldog. I mean, Parley says it's the largest bulldog he ever saw. So the largest breed of a bulldog is a mastiff bull. But if you tell people a big bulldog, you know, they think, uh, you know, like a dog dog. Well, most of you are familiar with Hagrid in Harry Potter. His dog 
is a mastiff bull. So when you hear this story, I want you to think of Hagrid's dog, because that's what really puts it in perspective. He says, After sitting a while by the fire in charge of the officer, I requested to step out. I walked out into public square accompanied by him and said, Mr. Peabody, are you good at a race? No, said he, but my big bulldog is, and he's been trained to assist me in my office for several years. He'll take down any man at my bidding. Well, Mr. Peabody, you've compelled me to go with you a mile. I've gone with you too. You have given me opportunity to preach and to sing and have also entertained me with lodging and breakfast. I must now go on my journey, and if you're good at a race, you can accompany me. I thank you for your kindness. Good day, sir. I then started on my journey while he stood amazed and not able to step one foot before the other. Seeing this, I halted and turned to him again, inviting him to a race. He stood amazed. I then renewed my exertion and soon increased my speed to something like that of a deer. He did not awake from his astonishment sufficiently to start in pursuit till I had gained perhaps 200 yards. I had already leaped a fence and was making my way through a field in the forest on the right of the road. He now came hollowing after me and shouting to his dog to seize me. The dog, being one of the largest I'd ever seen, came close on my footsteps with all fury. The officer behind him in pursuit, clapping his hands and hollowing, Stew boy! Stew boy! Take him! Watch! Lay hold of him, I say! Down with him! And pointing his finger in the direction I was running. The dog was fast overtaking me, and in the act of leaping upon me, you can just picture Hagrid's dog with all his slobber <laughs> just ready to leap on him. When quick as lightning, the thought struck me to assist the officer in sending the dog with all fury to the forest, a little distance before me. I pointed my finger in that direction, clapped my hands, and shouted in imitation of the officer. The dog hastened past me with redoubled speed towards the forest, being urged by the officer and myself, and both of us running in the same direction. Gaining the forest, I soon lost sight of the officer and the dog and have not seen them since. <laughs> he was reunited with his brethren and he finished that mission. He served another mission in a similar area. He returned home and you'd think the guy served two missions. Everything must be great at home. Well, no. His wife had never had any children, and for six years, she'd suffered with consumption. Consumption is tuberculosis, which is still one of the main killers of human beings on earth today. And he had spent the winter with her, the late fall and the winter, and in the spring, he was contemplating what to do because people were being sent here and there on missions. A knock came at the door, and it was Heber C. Kimball. And Heber C. Kimball came in and made a prophecy to him. Brother Parley, thy wife shall be healed from this hour, and shall bear a son, and his name shall be Parley, and he shall be a chosen instrument in the hands of the Lord to inherit the priesthood and to walk in the steps of his father. He shall do a great work in the earth in ministering the word and teaching the children of men. Arise, therefore, and go forth in the ministry, nothing doubting. Take no thoughts for your debts, nor the necessities of life, for the Lord will supply you with abundant means for all things. Thou shalt go to Upper Canada, even to the city of Toronto, the capital, and there thou shalt find a people prepared for the fullness of the gospel, and they shall receive thee. And thou shalt organize the church among them, and it shall spread thence into the regions round about. And many shall be brought to the knowledge of the truth, and shall be filled with joy. And from the things growing out of this mission shall the fullness of the gospel spread into England, and cause a great work to be done in that land. Parley believed the Lord, believed this prophecy, and he left on his mission. He didn't have a penny. Someone gave him a purse. Someone gave him a little tiny bit of money. And they were able to make their way to the head of Lake Ontario to a town called Hamilton. And as he began to approach the city of Hamilton, he had a thought come to him that 
he was in a strange country. He was in a strange city. He didn't know anybody. He was flat broke. And somehow he had to get across this huge body of water to Toronto where he didn't know anybody. And this is what he said. He said, I had at many times received answer to prayers in such matters. But now it seemed hard to exercise faith because I was among strangers and entirely unknown. The Spirit seemed to whisper to me to try the Lord and see if anything was too hard for him, that I might know and trust him under all circumstances. I retired to a secret place in the forest and prayed to the Lord for money to enable me to cross the lake. I then entered Hamilton and commenced to chat with some of the folks. I had not tarried many minutes before I was accosted by a stranger who inquired my name and where I was going. He also asked me if I did not want some money. I said, yes. He then gave me $10 and a letter of introduction to John Taylor of Toronto, where I arrived that evening. So the morning he said his prayer, he entered a strange city. A man gave him money for passage, but more important, gave him a letter of introduction to a future prophet of the church. Parley was amazing. He couldn't be held down. If you guys have never read this book, The Life and Travels of Parley P. Pratt, I recommend it very highly. It is an inspiring book. Parley P. Pratt was an amazing man. I hope you've enjoyed Brother Merrill's inspirational stories today. I want to end with a shout out to my friend Luther Palmer. He gave me a boost at the very beginning of my efforts with YouTube, and it proved to be very helpful. And I thank you, Luther. And if you guys aren't familiar with his channel, it's Watcher Palmer. Luther has a grasp of the gospel and has studied and traveled and has some wonderful insights. So I recommend his station very highly. I hope you've enjoyed my story today. Thanks for watching. And remember, stay tuned Wednesday, the 27th of March, 2024, at 7.30. I'm going to do my first live broadcast, and it's going to be a lot more stuff from this book about Farley P. Pratt, because there's some great stuff in there. Thanks for watching.